Hello students, welcome to GE9 Results Life and Works. Today, we're going to talk about the chapter 2 of our subject, the Philippine condition during the 19th century as a results context. So, we will try to look back to the condition of the Philippines noong mga panahon na nabubuhay si Dr. Jose Rizal. To fully comprehend the role Dr. Jose Rizal played in shaping the Filipino nationalism, there is a need for us to look in the developments in the 19th century. So we will try to look back kung ano ba yung condition ng Philippines when it comes to its political, social, and economic situation. We will try to look at Spain and Philippines in the 19th century. This is vital in helping us to appreciate results leadership in working for the country's freedom. Let's start this by looking back to the situation of Spain during the 19th century. So first, political instability in Spain. After the death, of King of Spain, Ferdinand VII, Spain went through a downward spiral as a world power. So meaning to say, uh, nung namatay na si Ferdinand VII, unti-unti nang uh, bumababa yung puwersa ng Spain. So remember, Spain is one of the uh, countries na naging pioneer when it comes to conquest or yung pananakop. By 1830, all of Spain's American colonies have became independent except Cuba and Puerto Rico. So meaning to say, noong 1830, lahat ng uh, nasakop na bansa ng Spain sa Amerika ay nagsimula ng lumaya except for Cuba and Puerto Rico. So nawalan ng king ang Spain, the question here is who will be his successor? So a struggle for throne followed between the forces loyal to Ferdinand's daughter, Isabella, and his brother, Charles. This event became known as the Carlist Wars, yung struggle between Isabella and Charles, kung sino sa kanila ang magmamana sa trono. The forces loyal to Isabella defeated the Carlists, allowing her to become the sole female monarch of Spain. So, siya yung naging isang babae na naging head ng Spain nung time na to. There were frequent changes in the government of Spain even after Isabella's overthrow in 1868. So, kahit na nung napaalis na si Isabella noong 1868 sa trono, marami pa rin changes na nangyari sa government ng Spain. We can say that the 19th century was a period of turbulent century in Spanish history. It was a period of political instability owing to the rise and fall of government. So, para maiwasan yung patuloy na pagbagsak ng government ng Spain and to save the country from political disunity, the Spanish crown uh, implemented what we call Canovite system or the rotativism. So, what do we mean by Canovite system or rotativism? Under this policy, the liberals and conservatives in Spain took turns in administering their country. So when we say liberal, sila yung mga tao na gusto ng pagbabago. Open-minded sila at gusto rin ng uh, makinig sa ideya ng iba, tumatanggap sila ng ideya ng iba. Unlike sa conservative na sila yung tutol sa pagbabago, okay? Ayaw nilang tumanggap ng opinion nila. Mas naniniwala sila dun sa traditional, okay? Yung makaluma sila. And of course, nung time na to, uh, sa government ng Spain, papalit-palit lang kung sino yung mamumuno, kung anong uh, political ideology yung ipapatupad nila sa Spain. Of course, Philippines is a colony of Spain. So, sa madaling salita, tayo ay isang bansa na nasakop ng Spain. So, kung anong nangyayari sa Spain, naapektuhan yung mga colonies niya at kabilang na dito ang Philippines. That is why there were also frequent changes na nangyari when it comes to the government of Philippines during the 19th century. And in addition with this, the Philippines became the dumping ground of uh, relatives and favorites of Spanish politicians in Spain. Meaning to say, yung mga uh, relatives na mga taong may puesto sa government sa Spain and of course, yung mga favorite nila na tao, pinapadala nila dito sa Philippines para magkaroon ng position. Abandonment of mercantilism. Along with political change, there was also a shift in the world economy. So, noong 19th century, hindi lang naman about the political system of the Philippines during the Spanish period yung nagbago. Okay, so when it comes to its uh, economy, may pagbabago din na nangyari. So, before the 19th century, uh, yung mga European, they practice mercantilism. Ano ba tong mercantilism? It's an economic doctrine based on the idea that 
the country's wealth and power can be measured in its stock of gold and silver. So, ibig sabihin, ito yung paniniwala or belief na mayaman ng isang bansa depende sa kung gaano karami yung ginto nila at yung silver na meron sila. Okay? So, dun na may measure yung yaman ng isang bansa. That is the idea of mercantilism. And aside from that, it also means that all trade should be conducted within a certain country and its colonies. So, ibig sabihin, kapag may trading or may uh, palitan ng mga produkto sa bawat bansa, ang pwede lang makipagpalitan ay yung bansang nanakop at yung mga bansang kanyang nasakop. Okay? When we say colony kasi, ito yung mga bansang nasakop. So, yung trading noong 19th century ay limited, okay? Kontrolado siya because trade was dictated by the monarch and wealth should flow toward the center of imperial power. So, ibig sabihin, kontrolado ng hari at ng reyna yung pakikipagkalakalan, okay? So, ito yung naging resulta kung bakit nagkaroon ng monopolistic ventures like yung galleon trade, di ba? It's a trade between Manila and Acapulco which began in 1565. So, here in Manila, Acapulco trade, of course, kabilang ang Philippines. And ang Pilipinas noon ay pinagbabawal na makipagkalakalan sa iba't ibang uh, European countries. As time passed by, there was a shift towards lies of hair or free market trade. Ibig sabihin ng lies of hair, countries and their colonies began trading with one another. So, regardless of what country it is, they are free to trade with one another. And there are some countries who demand for Philippine products such as sugar, coffee, rice, indigo, and tobacco. With the uselessness of mercantilism, the Philippines was officially opened to foreign trade by 1834. So, eto na, by this year, meron ng free market trade sa Philippines and the other countries. Nagkaroon na ng uh, malawakang pakikipagkalakalan or pakikipagpalitan ng produkto ng bawat bansa, kahit ano pang country yan, okay? So, anong naging effect ng free trade? Okay, so foreign trade brought fort wealth for more people. Ibig sabihin, yumaman, yung mga tao, yung mga taong uh, sumasali sa pakikipagkalakalan. Before, only the Spaniards benefited from the galleon trade, but nung nagkaroon na ng uh, free trade, the growers and traders of Philippine products gained wealth. So, pati mga uh, Filipino merchants ay nagkaroon din ng pagkakataon na yumaman, okay, dahil sa free trade. At the same time, there was also a rising class composed of merchants who were mostly mestizos. Sila yung nag ng advantage from foreign trade with other countries. So, when we say mestizos, sila yung mga tao na may halong lahi. For example, may lahing Pilipino, may lahing Chinese, okay, or pwede rin uh, half Spanish, half Chinese, or half Filipino, half Spanish, okay? Spain's adoption of the lies of fair policy affected the Philippines in several ways. The result of greater participation in trade created a new middle class in the colony. So, dahil nga nagkaroon tayo ng uh, free trade noong uh, late 19th century, syempre madaming tao ang na-involve dito sa iba't ibang bansa. And ito yung naging rason kung bakit umusbong yung tinatawag nating middle class. So ano ba itong middle class? Kumbaga sa isang pyramid, sila yung nasa gitnang level. Okay? So sa uh, social status ng isang society, sila yung mga nakakaangat sa buhay. Sila yung uh, may wealth. Okay? Hindi sila yung nasa pinakatuktok at hindi rin naman sila yung nasa pinakababa. At sila ay tinatawag nating middle class. So anong naging resulta nito? Of course, dahil may pera na sila, so they were able to send their children to school to acquire higher education. Okay? So, majority na mga Pilipino noon ay nakapag-aral sa ibang bansa. Okay? Sa Spain sila nag-aral. And then, dito na nagkaroon ng new perspectives itong mga educated persons on uh, Spain's maltreatment in the Filipino people. Okay, so of course, nakapag-aral sila. Okay, na enlightened sila. And dito na na-realize ano mga educated or yung mga tinatawag nating enlightened ones, yung uh, pang-aabuso, okay, mga injustices, oppressions ng mga Spanish colonials sa Philippines. As I have mentioned to you earlier, uh, ito mga Filipino people ay nakapag-aral sila sa Europe, particularly sa Spain. Of course, uh, they were able to meet European people. 
nagkaroon ng intercommunication with one another. And because of this, uh, they were able to bring home political ideas prevailing in Europe. Okay? So, yung mga idea na uh, na-discover nila at nalaman at natutunan nila sa Europe nung sila ay nag-aral, ay naiuwi nila dito sa Pilipinas. Daladala na nila yun. Okay? So, majority ng mga ideas, it's about equality and God-given rights. And aside from this, the opening of the Suez Canal in 1869 and the laying of a telegraph line which connected the Philippines to the rest of the world brought Europe closer to the Philippines and the Enlightenment ideas became more prevalent among the members of the middle class. So what is this Suez Canal? It's a human-made waterway na nagko-connect ng dalawang continents, okay? Asia and Europe. So nung nagkaroon ng Suez Canal, mas napadali yung travel time uh, between Europe and Asia. So those people na nakapag-aral, they were called as Illustrados or the Enlightened Ones. And because of this, they started to question the abuses of the Spanish regime and began to clamor for reform. So, mihingi na sila ng reforma at dito na nag-start yung kanilang pagkakwestiyon. Okay? Na-realize na nila na mali yung pamamalakad ng Spanish government. So, sila yung mga nanguna sa pagpapatupad ng reforma. At dito nakabilang si Dr. Jose Rizal. Okay? Isa rin siyang ilustrado dahil nga si Rizal ay nakapag-aral. Okay, now let's move on to the administrative organization during the 19th century. Noong 19th century, of course, wala naman tayong president, okay? Pero meron tayong hari, that is the king of Spain. Siya ang pinaka-ruler noong 19th century, okay? So, the Spanish colonial government in the Philippines ran indirectly through the viceroy of the Spain in Mexico, okay? Since Spain was far from the country, napakalayo ng Spain sa Pilipinas, the Spanish king ruled the islands or ruled our country through the Viceroy of Mexico, which was then another Spanish colony. So, nasakop din ng Spain ang Mexico. Noong hawak pa or sakop pa ng Spain ang bansang Mexico, sila yung nagiging representative ng King of Spain para sa Philippines. Okay? So, ang organization that is King of Spain and then next doon ay yung Viceroy of Mexico. Siya yung nag-uugnay, siya yung nagiging mediator, siya yung pinaka-ambasador ng King of Spain para sa mga Pilipino. Okay? Kaya lang, nung nakalaya na at naging independent country na ang Mexico, sa pamumuno ng Spain noong 1821, the Spanish King ruled the Philippines through a governor general. Okay? So, siya na yung naging representative ng King of Spain nung lumaya na ang Mexico. So, the governor general appointed by the Spanish monarch was the head of the Spanish colonial government. Okay, si governor general, pinili siya mismo ng King of Spain para maging representative. So, ang pinaka-leader natin noon ay ang hari ng Spanya or King of Spain. At ang pinakamataas na official na nakatira sa Pilipinas ay ang Governor General. So aside from that, the Governor General was also the Vice Royal Patron, meaning to say he could nominate priests for administration of the parishes. So pwede siyang mamili kung sino yung mga pari ang iaasay niya or dadalhin niya sa mga parishes. So aside from that, he was the Commander-in-Chief of the Colonial Army. So to make it simple, siya ang pinakamakapangyarihan Okay? Sa Pilipinas noon, the Governor General was the uh, most powerful official in the Philippines. So, he was also the President of the Royal Audiencia. Uh, sa panahon natin ngayon, siya yung Chief Justice ng Supreme Court. Okay? So, itong Royal Audiencia, ito na yung Supreme Court natin ngayon. So, let's try to imagine that. Siya na nga yung highest ranking official sa Philippines. Siya pa yung may hawak ng Supreme Court. So, yung mga batas na ipinapatupad ng Governor General, ang tawag natin doon, Actos Acordados. And aside from that, meron ding power si Governor General. Ito yung tinatawag natin kumplase. Okay? So, he have the power to decide which law or royal decree should be implemented or disregarded. So, nasa sa kanya yung huling desisyon kung ang isang batas ba ay dapat aprubahan or hindi. Okay? So, just for your information, The first Governor General of the Philippines was Miguel Lopez de Legazpi. 
and the last Governor General was Diego de los Rios. Ang Governor General minsan kasi naabuso niya rin yung kanyang power. So mayroong tatlong inatasan ang King of Spain para bantayan yung responsibilities niya. So first we have Residencia. Anong trabaho ni Residencia? So sila yung nag investigate sa naging performance ni Governor General. Okay? So normally, ang susunod na Governor General, yung papalit dun sa current Governor General, ay nanggagaling din sa grupo ng Residencia. So basically, their role is to provide feedback. Ang role nila is to make sumbong, okay? Mag-report kay King of Spain kung ano yung mga ginagawa ni Governor General. And take note, sa members ng residensya, dun din manggagaling yung susunod na Governor General. Next, we have the Visitador. Sila naman ay hindi nag stay sa Philippines, okay? Pabisi-bisita lang sila. Unlike kay residensya, from the word resident, okay? So, ibig sabihin, tumitira sila, okay? Kung saan namumuno si Governor General. Sa visitador kasi, pabisi-bisita lang sila. So, ang role naman nila is bantayan yung mga nasasakupan na lugar ni Governor General. So, they go from one province to another. And last one, we have the Royal Ojensha. Sila yung pinakamataas na korte sa Pilipinas noong 19th century. Kaya lang, ito kasing Royal Ojensha, hawak din ito ni Governor General kasi nga member din siya dito. Okay? So overall, sila yung mag inspect sila yung magbibigay ng report kay King of Spain kung ano yung mga actions and mga uh, ginagawa ni Governor General. Below the national government were the local government units. Okay, so andito na yung provinces, towns, cities, and barrios. Pagdating kasi sa ating local government, meron tayong dalawang type of local government. Dalawang uri. We have the alcaldia. And we have the Corregimiento. So, yung Alcaldia, it was headed by the Alcalde Mayor. And sa Corregimiento naman, it was headed by the Corregidor. So, sa Alcaldia, ito yung mga provinces na under na sa Spanish control. Okay? Unlike sa Corregimiento, sila naman yung mga provinces that were not entirely under Spanish control. For example, Bataan and Mindoro. So, he exercised executive and judicial functions. And take note, the provincial government was the most corrupt unit in local government noong 19th century. So why? It's because they're privileged to engage in and monopolize trade called indulto de comercio. So meron kasi silang privilege. Ito kasi mga alcalde mayor, they have the privilege to join the indulto de comercio. Okay? So ito yung the right to uh, participate in trading. Okay? Makipag-participate sa pakikipagkalakalan. The alcaldias or provinces were divided into towns or pueblos. The alcaldias or yung mga provinces, nahati sila into towns or pueblos. So, bawat pueblo, uh, pinamumunuan ng gobernador silyo or the town mayor. Okay? At first, he was elected by all married males. Kaya lang noong 19th century, he was voted by 13 electors. At kasali din dito yung papaalis na sa puesto na Gobernador Silio. Okay? So as the town executive, ang responsibility ni Gobernador Silio is for tax collection. To ensure collection and remittance of these taxes, uh, nire-require na si Gobernador Silio to mortgage his properties to the government at the beginning of his term of office. So each town was divided into barrios or mga barangay. As the smallest unit of government, each barangay was headed by a cabeza de barangay. So ito na yung barangay captain na tinatawag natin sa panahon natin ngayon. Okay, ano bang ba function ni cabeza de barangay? Maintenance of peace and order and the collection of taxes and tributes in the barangay. A key figure in the local administrative setup was the Spanish friar. This was because of the union of the church and state in the Philippines before. Okay? Let me emphasize, the friar was the supervising representative of the Spanish government for all local affairs. Okay? So meaning to say, kailangan pa rin yung approval ng Spanish friar sa lahat ng ginagawa ng local officials. Okay? So basically speaking, he was practically the ruler of the town as he was the local uh, school inspector health inspector, prison inspector, inspector of the accounts of the Gobernador Silios, and Cabeza de Barangay. So, andun pa rin yung pangingi alam ng Spanish friar 
in handling the affairs of the local uh, government officials. So the approval of Spanish friars was required in census lists, tax lists, list of army conscripts, and register of births, deaths, and marriages. So basically speaking, na-involve pa rin yung Spanish friar sa government ng Philippines noong 19th century. Okay, so uh, the friars became more powerful and influential that even civil authorities feared them. So ito na yung situation na tinawag ni Graciano Lopez ay na bilang Frilocracia. So ano ang ibig sabihin ng Frilocracia? So when we say Frilocracy, it's the rule of the friars. Okay, The Spanish friars were so influential and powerful that they even practically ruled the Philippines. So ganito yung impact ng mga pari noong 19th century sa government. So sila rin yung dahilan kung bakit hindi stable ang uh, government ng Philippines noon. Okay? So, dahil meron pa rin yung impluensya nila. Ang nangyari, hinigpitan lalo ng Spain yung pagkontrol sa Philippines dahil sa impluensya ng mga pari. Dahil sa takot nila na baka daw mawala ang Pilipinas sa kanilang kamay. Okay? So natatakot sila na lumaya ang Philippines. Andun pa rin yung impluensya ng Spanish friar. Kailangan yung opinion nila pinapakinggan. So aside from friars na kinakatakutan ng mga Filipino natives before, Andito rin yung Guardia Civil. Okay? So the Guardia Civil was organized in 1867. So sila yung mga police under the leadership of the Spanish officers. Okay? Ano bang purpose nila? They have to deal with outlaws and renegades. So sila yung in charge dun sa mga lumalabag sa batas at isa rin sila sa pinakakatakutan ng mga Filipino natives noong 19th century. So we have this term filibusteros and erehes. Pag filibusteros Yun yung tawag dun sa mga kalaban ng government. And pag erehes naman, or erehes, sila naman yung mga kalaban ng Catholic Church. Judicial power was vested on the royal audiencia, the Supreme Court during those times. As I have mentioned to you earlier, isa sila sa mga nag inspect sa ginagawa ni Governor General. The royal audiencia did not only adjudicate appeals for civil and criminal cases, it also served as a forum for settling important issues on governance and an auditing agency of the finances of Spanish colonial administration in the country. Philippine representation in the Spanish Cortes or lawmaking body was abolished in 1837. Isa rin ito sa kinakagalit ng mga Filipinos noon. Wala tayong representative sa Spanish court sa Spain. So tuwing merong meetings, may mga deliberations, walang nagre-represents para sa mga Filipinos. Overall, Spanish colonial administration in the Philippines was corrupt and inefficient. Maraming factors tayong i-consider bakit nasabing naging corrupt sila and hindi naging effective yung kanilang pamumuno. So dahil nga malayo ang Philippines sa Spain, the Governor General exercise absolute powers. Naging bias itong Governor General kasi binibigyan niya ng position yung mga kilala niya, yung mga kaibigan niya, yung mga tao malapit sa kanya even na hindi naman sila qualified para dun sa government position. Although meron yung presence ng visitador, ng residensya at ng royal audiencia, kaya lang hindi siya naging enough for the Governor General to resist the corruption for his personal advantage. Hindi naging effective ang administration noong Spanish period sa Philippines. Another source of weakness and abuse ng Spanish government ay yung pagbebenta ng uh, government position. Okay? So, hindi na naging basis yung competency, yung kakayahan nung isang uh, tao para do sa position but his ability to buy the position. So, anong naging impact nito? It gave rise to misadministration of governmental affairs, bribery, as well as graft and corruption. Now, let's move on to the social structure of Filipino during the 19th century. Ano ba yung kalagayan ng uh, ating lipunan noong panahon ng mga Kastila dito sa Pilipinas? So, let's take a look back to the society. The Filipinos were treated as slaves by the Spaniards. That is true. Okay? So, ang tingin sa atin noon ng mga uh, Spanyol ay mga alipin. Okay? So, feeling nila sila yung superior and of course, mababa yung tingin sa bawat Pilipino. They even imposed and collected taxes and tributes to the natives and even required them to render a polo servicio or yung tinatawag nating forced labor to the Spanish government and to the Spanish friars. So yung polo servicio, it's a forced labor na kung saan 
lahat ng mga lalaki ay kailangan mag-render ng service sa uh, Spanish government and sa church. Okay? So, kung ikaw ay nabubuhay sa panahon ng 19th century at ikaw ay 16 to 60 years old, kailangan mo mag-render ng service for 40 days okay, sa Spanish government and sa church. The only way para ma-avoid mo yung forced labor ay kailangan mo magbayad ng tinatawag nilang fala. The social structure of Spain was pyramidal, okay, pyramid, due to their adherence to the doctrine of limpieza de sangre or purity of blood. So, yung social structure na inimplement ng Spain ay nahati yan sa apat, okay? So, we have the Peninsulares, Insulares, Creoles, and the Indios, okay? So, sa pinakatuktok, uh, dun kabilang yung mga Peninsulares. So, sino yung mga Peninsulares? Sila yung mga Spanish people na ipinanganak sa Spain and then tumira sa Pilipinas. Next class, we have Insulares. Sila naman yung mga Spanish people na ipinanganak sa Pilipinas at dito na rin sila nanirahan. So, the third class was Creole. Sila naman yung mga mixed blood. It's either combination of Spanish, Chinese, and Filipino. So, dito napapasok yung Ilustrado and Principalia. Sa Ilustrado, sila yung mga enlightened ones. Sila yung mga nakapag-aral sa ibang bansa. And dito kabilang si Dr. Jose Rizal. Next, we have the Principalia. Sila naman yung mga may dugong maharlika. Sila naman yung mga may kamag-anak sa government. For example, yung mga datu. And the last one, we have the angels. Okay? Sila yung mga nadidiscriminate. And majority ng mga Filipinos na walang-wala sa buhay ay dito kabilang. Okay? As a consequence of Spanish implementation of their doctrine, Limpieza de Sangre, nagkaroon ng social ranking sa uh, Pilipinas. That is why merong discrimination na nangyayari. As a result, social tensions were created between the upper class and the lower class, wherein the lower class were victimized by the upper class. And then yung mga higher positions sa government ay binibigay mostly dun sa mga pure-blooded Spanish. Okay? Ang tingin nila sa mga uh, middle class and mga inchos ay nasa mababang level. Okay? And then they also believe that these inferior uh, people are not worthy of education. Now, let's move on to the educational system noong 19th century. So, up to the middle of the 19th century, schools were under the control of the friar. So, kahit sa sistema ng edukasyon noong 19th century, nandun pa rin yung part ng mga Spanish friars. Nandun pa rin yung pangingi alam nila. Okay? So, primary education was not given attention despite the establishment of parochial schools in many towns. Kahit may mga schools sa bawat uh, lugar sa probinsya ng uh, Philippines noon, hindi pa rin binibigyan ng atensyon yung education. Ang mga Espanyol talaga, ayaw nilang nakakapag-aral. Okay? Ayaw nilang natututo ang mga katutubo or the Filipino natives kasi nga, nandun yung fear nila, andun yung takot nila na kapag uh, natuto or nagkaroon ng kaalaman ang mga natives, mga kapwa nating Pilipino, yun yung magiging way para magkaroon ng reforma or humingi sila ng reforma. Maaring yun din ang maging dahilan para magkaroon ng revolution. Ano ba yung focus ng system of education on? So, their instruction are centered on the teaching of God and obedience to the friars. Majority talaga ng tinuturo noong uh, 19th century when it comes to their system of education is more on religion. And you know what? The children in these schools were taught that they were of inferior intelligence and were suited only for manual work. So, parang dun pa lang, dinadown na nila or mababa yung tingin nila sa mga bata, okay? Sa mga Filipino children. And you know what? Ang mga students noon, measure yung kanilang uh, kaalaman, hindi sa kung ano yung kanilang naiintindihan sa particular lesson, okay? So, their learning was measured in terms of how well they can parrot the contents of a book, okay? So, meaning to say, memorize nila kung ano yung mismong nasa libro, okay? As in, kung ano yung nasa content ng isang subject, yun yung uh, kinakabisado nila kahit na hindi nila naiintindihan. So, anong naging consequence? Of course, Filipino children were not able to develop self-confidence in their ability to learn, okay? Nandun yun eh, hindi nila na-enhance, hindi nila na-improve yung kanilang uh, self-confidence when it comes to learning. They were able to develop severe inferiority complex. 
So, bumaba yung tingin ng mga Filipino natives sa uh, uh, kakayahan nila, sa sarili nila. So, because of this, uh, the culture of silence came to be instilled in the minds of the Filipino learners. Kasi in the first place naman, ayaw talaga ng mga Spaniards or uh, they were hesitant to offer and give education to educate the Filipino natives. Okay? Kasi andun yung fear nila na baka kapag natuto na ang mga tao, doon na mag-start, na magkaroon ng revolution at questionin yung kanilang pamamalakad okay, sa Pilipinas. So by the end of the 19th century, only the University of Santo Tomas was the existing higher education institution in the Philippines. Yes, that is true. University of Santo Tomas lang ang uh, institution, okay, ang school na nag exist noon noong 19th century. Okay? So, ang UST kasi, it was founded by the Dominicans in 1611. Meaning to say, mga paring Dominican ang nagpatayo ng University of Santo Tomas. Okay? At ang University of Santo Tomas lang din ang nag-offer ng mga courses sa uh, medicine, pharmacy, theology, philosophy, as well as canon and civil law. Nagsisimula pa lang itong institution na to, majority na mga nag-aaral at nag enroll dito ay mga Spaniards and Mestizos. Nevertheless, its doors were open to the Filipinos during the last half of the 19th century. So as time goes by, uh, naging open naman na siya for the Filipino people. Kaya may mga uh, Filipino natives rin na nakapag-aral sa University of Santo Tomas. Ang mga Spaniards din, nag-open din sila ng uh, secondary schools or pang high school exclusively for the boys. At yung mga kilalang school dito, we have the Colegio de Santo Tomas and the San Juan de Letran sa Manila. It was headed by the Dominicans. And we also have the Ateneo Municipal. Ang mga namumuno naman dito ay mga paring Jesuits. Ilang naman school for boys ang meron. Meron din for girls. And then, the following schools, ito yung mga uh, kilala na secondary schools for girls. We have Santa Isabel, La Concordia, Santa Rosa, Santa Catalina. Okay? So, itong mga schools na to, ini-inspect pa rin ito, okay? Under inspection pa rin siya ng Dominican Rector, okay? Na galing sa University of Santo Tomas. And then, yung mga students na gustong uh, mag-aral, mag-enroll sa mga schools na to, they have to take an examination, okay? Bago sila makapasok or ma-admit sa school. It was also in the 19th century when public education for the natives was begun. So, Dumating din sa time na na-i-offer din yung education para sa mga natives, okay? Filipino natives. Meron tayong uh, decree na ipinatupad ng Spanish government before, the Educational Decree of 1863. Anong meron dito, sir? So, etong Educational Decree of 1863, it required the establishment of one elementary school for boys and one elementary school for girls in each town in the Philippines. So, dahil sa decree na ito, nagkaroon ng mga school for boys and girls sa bawat bayan. So, with this decree also, ito rin yung uh, nag-establish ng school para sa training of teachers with a mastery of the Spanish language. So, itong mga teachers na tinetrain, they use Spanish as their medium of instruction. But, take note also that the friars resisted the teaching of Spanish language to the Filipinos. Okay? So, parang hesitant pa sila noon eh. Ayaw nilang ituro yung language nila na Espanyol sa mga Pilipino. So why? They believe that knowledge of the language would lead to the development of political and social awareness among the natives. So ano magiging effect? So of course, kapag natutunan ng Filipino natives yung language nila at nakapag-aral sila, it could trigger them the desire to work for freedom and independence. Kaya hesitant din silang i-offer or ituro yung uh, Spanish language sa mga natives. And of course, yung uh, education. Kaya ang pinofocus talaga nila noong 19th century sa uh, system of education is the teaching of religion. So they believe that they should keep the Filipinos ignorant. But it does not mean na hindi naman ginamit yung Spanish language sa iba't ibang school. Kasi, uh, for example, sa Ateneo, sa Letran, and UST, ang ginagamit nilang medium of instruction was Spanish. Although the Spanish government exerted efforts to educate 
the Filipinos in the 19th century, the educational system implemented in our country had serious weaknesses. Okay? So, ano yung mga naging problema when it comes to the system of education during the 19th century? So, first, overemphasis on religion. Okay? As I have mentioned to you earlier, ang focus ng subject nila ay more on religion, more on God. Second, limited and irrelevant curriculum. So, hindi lahat ng mga kailangan sana na subjects na ituro sa mga students ay hindi na i-offer. Okay? So, limitado. And madalas, irrelevant din yung mga itinuturo or wala namang connect dun sa kailangang competency na matutunan ng isang student. And the third one, obsolete classroom facilities. Okay? So, napaglipasan na ng panahon yung mga facilities noon. Okay, so, hindi na siya na-update, hindi siya bago. Hindi yun nakatulong to improve the teaching of the teacher and the learning of the students. It's inadequate instructional materials, okay? Hindi rin sapat yung uh, facilities sa isang classroom. Yung mga libro, yung mga kagamitan ng students at pati ng uh, teacher, hindi rin naging sapat. Okay? And then next one, the absence of academic freedom. Yes, walang academic freedom ang mga students noon. Kung ano ang desisyon ng teacher, kung ano ang desisyon ng uh, government na ituro sa mga natives, yun lang din. And the last one, we have the racial prejudice against the Filipinos in a school. Of course, ito yung hindi talaga nawala noong 19th century. So, nagkaroon pa rin ng division between the higher class and the lower class. Ito yung naging resulta ng pagkakaroon natin ng uh, social class sa society noong 19th century. Okay? So, hindi ito naiwasan at hindi rin ito nawala kahit sa system of education. Now, let's move on to the economic situation during the 19th century. The country was opened to foreign trade in 1834. Okay? So, nung nagbukas ang Suez Canal at nakisali ang Philippines sa trading, nagkaroon ng mga significant changes sa Philippines. Hindi lang naman tayo nag import ng mga products ng ibang bansa na kailangan din ng mga Pilipino. We also have agricultural products na ina-export natin sa ibang countries. Okay? For example, uh, sugar, rice, hemp, and tobacco. So, the growing prosperity of Philippines in the 19th century had significant consequences. So, ano ba yung mga pagbabagong nangyari nung 19th century nung nagbukas na ang Philippines sa trading. First, it increased Filipino contacts with foreigners. Of course, iba't ibang uh, nationalities na yung pumapasok at lumalabas sa ating bansa. At yun din yung naging dahilan kung bakit uh, nagkaroon ng communication with other nationalities. Okay? Because of trading. Second, they were able to send their children for an education in Europe. So, itong mga middle class, yung mga nakakaangat-angat sa buhay, at sila rin naman, yung uh, majority sa nila ay nakisali sa trading. Okay? So, they were able to send their children sa Europe para mag-aral. Because they have the money, kaya nilang matustusan yung pag-aaral ng mga anak nila kahit sa ibang bansa. And the last one, Filipinos who were educated abroad were able to absorb the intellectual developments in Europe. Okay? So, kung i-compare kasi natin yung... Uh, situation ng Philippines sa ibang country, mas liberal sila, mas open sila. So, marami silang natutunan sa ibang bansa. Just like Rizal, nung pumunta si Rizal sa ibang bansa para mag-aral, nagulat siya kasi ibang-iba yung uh, situation ng Philippines as compared to Spain nung nasa Madrid siya para mag-aral. Okay? Okay, now let's move on to the different socio-economic policies imposed by the Spaniards. Noon ang mga Pilipino, nakatira sila sa malalayong uh, komunidad. Okay, watak-watak sila. And then, nung na-implement itong reduction, pinagsama-sama ngayon yung mga Pilipino sa iisang lugar. Okay, at yun yung tinatawag nilang reduction. Maraming tao ang tumutol dito of course dahil unang-una napabayaan na nila yung mga pananim nila at the same time yung mga alaga nilang hayop. Pero wala silang nagawa. Naging centralized ngayon yung pamamahala sa mga Pilipino, okay? So, nilagay sila sa isang lugar kung saan malapit yung palengke, munisipyo, sementeryo, at pati yung mga paaralan, okay? And of course, the church. Bakit malapit din sa church? It's because for the easy conversion of the natives to Catholicism. And naging madali rin para sa mga government officials na mangolekta ng 
buwis or ng tax kasi nga magkakatabi-tabi na lang yung mga bahay-bahay. Hindi na nila kailangang lumayo. Next, we have the bandala. Okay, the natives are obliged to sell their products to the Spaniards. Sa pilitan nilang binibili yung mga produkto ng mga Pilipino. Okay, so sa pilitan yung pagbebenta ng mga Filipino natives nung product nila or nung ani nila sa Spanish government. Spanish government yung nagde-decide ng presyo dun sa mga produkto. Instead na si seller or yung mga Filipino natives ang mag-decide kung magkano nila ibebenta yung produkto nila or yung ani nila, yung government mismo ang magde-decide kung ano yung presyo dapat nung paninda nila. Okay? Naging pahirap ito of course sa mga Pilipino dahil kadalasang hindi na babayaran yung mga produkto na mga magsasaka natin. And the third one, we have the Polo E. Servicio. Ano naman ang meron sa Polo E. Servicio? It's the forced labor of all Filipino males from 16 to 60 years old. Okay? So, kung ikaw ay nabubuhay noong 19th century at isa kang lalaki, ang edad mo na sa 16 to 60 years old, ikaw ay obliged at mandated na sumali sa Polo E. Servicios. And that is good for 40 days. And the word Polo refers to community work. Okay? And yung tawag natin sa mga laborer, sa mga manggagawa ay polista. Pwede bang hindi ako sumali sa polo iservisyo? Meron bang paraan? Of course, meron. Ito yung tinatawag nating fala. Kailangan mo magbayad ng fala para hindi ka mapasali sa forced labor. And in 1884, yung 40 days period ng pagre-render mo ng service ay nabawasan. Naging 15 days na lang. Gumagawa sila ng mga tulay, mga infrastructure, mga simbahan. Okay, and dumarating din sa time na kapag may expedition or sila ay kailangang lumayag, sila yung tagasagwan. And next, we have the taxation. So, we have different kinds of taxation. First, we have the cedula, uh, binabayaran ng mga lalaki at babae, 18 years old and above. Okay, every year ito nilang binabayaran. And then, we also have the sanctorum, yung tax na binabayaran ng mga Pilipino na mapupunta sa church. And the next one, we have the tribute. Okay, or tributo. Si Miguel Lopez de Legazpi ang kauna-unahang implement ng pagbabayad ng tributo. Okay? So, yung mga successors niya, yung mga sumunod na governor general sa kanya, ganito rin yung uh, in-implement. Okay? So, sinunod lang nila kung ano yung ginawa ni governor general Miguel Lopez de Legazpi. And this form of tax na hinihingi ng mga Spaniards ay pwedeng bayaran in cash or in kind. Okay? Kapag cash, of course, it's either money or gold. And then, kapag in kind naman, pwedeng mga products. The king of Spain preferred the payment of gold. Sino ba namang may ayaw na bigyan ka ng ginto noong 19th century, di ba? Noong panahon nila. But the natives, hindi naman lahat may kaya. Hindi naman lahat ay may ginto. Kaya madalas sa kanila ay nakakapagbayad in kind. Okay, mga produkto yung naibibigay nila. And the last one, we have the galleon trade. So, this trading policy changed the system of free trading in the Philippines wherein the other nationalities like the Chinese are free to exchange their goods with the Filipinos who had extra goods. Ano meron sa galleon trade? Ito yung kalakalan, trading na nangyari sa pagitan ng Philippines at Europe noong panahon ng Espanyol. Ang kalakalang galleon ay may ruta na mula Acapulco, Mexico. Okay? Yung Acapulco sa Mexico yan, patungo sa Maynila. Sa galleon trade, meron tayong tinatawag na boletas. Ano itong boletas? It's the ticket for galleon trade. You know, hindi lahat may privilege na sumama at makipagkalakalan noon. Okay? So, kung sino lang yung may mga boletas, sila lang yung pwedeng ma-engage sa trading. So that ends our lecture for today. I hope you have learned something and I hope I was able to enlighten your minds about Philippine conditions during the 19th century. Thank you so much for watching and...